Hello and welcome to the latest podcast from the Glasgow Centre for Population Health, supporting new approaches to improve health and tackle inequality. In this podcast, Anna Minton, writer, journalist and reader in architecture at University of East London, explores big capital, asking who is the city for? This was recorded in front of a live audience in Glasgow as part of the GCPH seminar series on the 2nd of December 2019. Okay, so um, yeah, I've titled uh, the talk Big Capital, Who is the City for? And um, obviously that's a slight spin on my book, Big Capital, Who is London for? So I'm going to talk about the main themes in the book Uh, which is very much about the housing crisis in London, but in the context of the housing crisis around the UK as a whole. And while it goes without saying everything I know about Scotland, uh, the housing system here is not nearly in as bad a mess as it is in England. But I feel fairly certain that some of the trends that I will be describing also apply in cities like Edinburgh uh, and in Glasgow. So the book is cited within London, the UK as a whole, and then the wider context of actually the post-industrial West, um, where uh, cities uh, all across the world, in fact, are suffering from similar types of housing crisis. North America, New York, San Francisco, some of the sort of more extremes, Uh, cases of this, Vancouver, Toronto, European cities as well from uh, Berlin to Barcelona. And um, the book is a very self-conscious reference to, the title of the book is a very self-conscious reference to uh, Thomas Piketty's uh, landmark book, Capital in the 21st Century. And his uh, underpinning theme is that in today's economy, the income from capital Uh, is greater than the income from growth and wages. And with uh, the income from property being the largest percentage of that income from capital, today we live fuelled by a property economy. And one of the really big points I try to make uh, in the book is that this is structural and it's systemic. It can't be separated off the housing crisis the property market crisis can't be separated off into an issue about first time buyers or uh, student renting or uh, renting uh, in the private rented sector. It's all part of the same big picture. And actually the crisis at the bottom of the housing market is directly linked to the crisis uh, at the top of the housing market. And I'm going to try and explain that Uh, as I go through the presentation and show how our property economy and its focus on the super rich uh, and on foreign investment, particularly in in a city like London, actually is directly linked to the displacement of communities Uh, and the destruction uh, of public housing in areas of high land values. So this is the first paragraph uh, of the book. And I um, saw this on Facebook just as I was finishing the book. It was actually a friend of mine posted this. And when I saw it, it was one of those slightly awful sort of journalistic moments when you read this awful thing and you think, yes, that's the start of my book. Uh, And she wrote, surrounded by boxes yet again, about to move, knowing that we will be moving again in the new year. I have cleaned and painted the new flat and it's still a dump with damp patches and a moth-eaten carpet throughout. I'm 46 and I have lived in over 30 houses and I still have no security. So she's a university graduate, she has a good job, she earns more than 40,000 pounds, her partner also works and they live in this tiny flat with one of their children, a 10 year old, sleeping, uh, well they did at that time, sleeping in an alcove under the stairs with just a curtain. So that's an idea actually of what are very common housing conditions uh, nowadays. Um, This slide is, as I'm sure all of you will know, uh, of the Grenfell Tower uh, disaster, which happened in uh, June 2017, just two weeks after the book was published. 
uh, which left me feeling in a very strange position actually because suddenly I was being asked to talk about the book but really for the worst possible reason. So I, I felt I had a responsibility to try and talk as well as I could about, about these themes. Um, at the time, I thought that Grenfell would be a turning point. I thought that it was a landmark moment from which we would look at housing differently forever after. Um, it has made a difference, but it has not been that turning point. So now I'm going to describe to you uh, the sort of city that we have uh, in London uh, and relate that to uh, other cities again. And this is a, a development somewhere in London, I think. I'm not even sure if it is a development or if it's a CGI. Uh, what we have increasingly are all these hoardings going up and advertising all the new luxury apartments which are coming. But actually, you can't tell um, even once they're built if these places are CGIs uh, or if they are, in fact, uh, the real thing. And this was the, this is, this is a real picture actually, that's the, the hoarding. This is part of uh, the Nine Elms development uh, in Battersea, which is one of the biggest developments uh, in, in London. Um, this one here I've included because this is Manchester. Uh, this is uh, apparently Manchester New Square, uh, privatised development, lots of luxury apartment housing. It's the same in Bristol, it's the same in York, it's, I'm sure, the same in Glasgow uh, and in Edinburgh. This type of ubiquitous uh, apartment building which is going up all over the country. In London, it is absolutely everywhere. If you were to drive along the South Bank from Wandsworth to Vauxhall, Southwark to Blackfriars, you would see gated enclave after gated enclave of high security, privatised development, uh, security guards, uh, uh, surveillance and CCTV everywhere. And what also distinguishes uh, a lot of these uh, developments is that this phenomenon of lights out London where a lot of the apartments are in fact empty because they're bought by investors uh, first and foremost, foremost as an investment rather than uh, as housing. So they don't even need to be lived in. And this at a time uh, of acute housing crisis uh, in the city. This here is a CGI. This is apparently uh, uh, a park which now built, I can assure you it doesn't look very much like this at all, called Elephant Park, uh, which is in the heart of Elephant and Castle in London. So remember this slide because we're going to come back to Elephant Park and we're going to talk about it in some detail because uh, Elephant and Castle was a case study I looked at in detail uh, as part of the book. This is certainly a CGI. This is uh, Battersea Power Station, the Battersea Power Station development, which, uh, as the architecture uh, critic Rowan Moore uh, said, they've actually managed to make the power station look small with this iconic Norman Foster star architecture. Um, and this here is the sky pool, uh, suspended 10 storeys high between two towers which is also one of the slides I put up to get a few laughs, basically, and to show you sort of how extreme this level of luxury uh, development has become. And this is all the new apartment building. Uh, but alongside this, in what are called the sort of super prime uh, parts of London, is this other phenomenon that we've become used to seeing. Uh, and the giveaway is this little structure outside these homes uh, and these are the iceberg basements because this is what you see on the outside, just the iceberg part uh, and underneath uh, might be this. Um, and this is obviously one of the, the more extreme types of basement. Uh, most of the luxury basements aren't three storeys deep with a uh, a swimming pool but as you can see according to research from Newcastle University uh, six of them in London are actually on this sort of level uh, and there are actually more than four and a half thousand uh, luxury basements which have been built uh, in London over the last decade and actually the wealth is going down uh, rather than up 
interestingly, and I think that fits with a desire of people, very, very rich individuals, to conceal their wealth. Uh, and London is home to more billionaires and more ultra high net worth individuals than uh, anywhere else in the world. Encouraged actively by someone we all know the name of, of course, and he uh, came out with this quote while he was London mayor, I don't want to expel any oligarchs, their cranes are sprouting across the city and it's marvellous, yet another of the really silly things he's prone to say. And he created a climate in London which actively welcomed uh, uh, this type of development and the influx of huge amounts of foreign money and foreign money often from very dubious sources uh, into the city. We know from the Economist magazine that there are 40,000 shell companies in London which own property. Shell companies with anonymous owners. We don't know who those uh, owners are and The Economist has made it clear that they think that is essentially uh, dodgy money. And we've seen the scandal of the Panama Papers. Uh, all this money actually is part of the property crisis uh, in London. So, you know, what people often say, well, you know, OK, fine, but surely it's a good thing that billionaires want to live in London. Isn't it a good thing for the city to attract wealth uh, and investment? And the answer that I put forward to the book in the book is that, yes, wealth does indeed trickle down, but it's not that form of trickle down uh, as a... Uh, the uh, governments of the day would have had us believe for the last 40 years that a rising tide floats all boats. Uh, actually, what wealth does, it trickles down and it displaces communities as prices rise and create uh, unaffordable, uh, large amounts of the city become uh, unaffordable. And what has happened in London is that the so-called old elites have been displaced from the traditionally exclusive areas such as Kensington and Chelsea. They can no longer afford to live there. So they will sell up uh, and they may buy their kids' homes in London, but not in Kensington and Chelsea. They'll move further out in what had previously been considered unfashionable areas such as Peckham, Acton, Forest Gate. In turn, these areas gentrify, prices go up, rents go up, and those residents are displaced out of London, uh, often to coastal towns, Margate, Hastings, all those towns on the south coast or Bristol. Uh, and alongside that, you get uh, soaring rents and poor conditions among people who do choose uh, to stay in London. So I'd say that is sort of one of the kind of myths, number one. Surely the influx of all this wealth is good for the city. Uh, myth number two is gentrification. Again, people say, look, this is gentrification. You know, the city has always uh, gentrified. And in order to deal with this, I think, first of all, we need to look at what gentrification actually is. It's a term which was introduced by the sociologist Ruth Glass to describe uh, parts of Islington in the 1960s. Uh, she wrote, one by one, many of the working class quarters of London have been invaded by the middle classes. Once this process of gentrification starts in a district, it goes on rapidly until all or most of the original working class occupiers are displaced and the whole social character of a district is changed. And we all know parts of our cities which have been subject to this process over 15, 20, 25 years, all over London, I'm sure all over uh, parts of, I'm sure parts of Glasgow very much uh, subscribe to this sort of process uh, uh, as well. Academics have also described super gentrification where big money has come in and, you know, the whole process is, is quicker. But what I argue in the book is that actually this is not gentrification. Simply, the speed of capital flows into London and other cities bear no relationship to what we saw between the 1960s and the 2000s. It's 
based upon Piketty's idea that today the rate of return on uh, capital is greater than on economic growth. And additional to this are a number of factors which have come into play since the financial crisis. This is a phenomenon which is a post-financial crash phenomenon and quantitative easing uh, has been a big part of it because that injected actually trillions into the economy and a disproportionate amount of that money went into the hands of the very wealthiest who used it to buy property in the most expensive parts of the city. Uh, in addition, we've had the very lax policies uh, in uh, uh, lax policies with regard to tax and regulation, which I've already uh, alluded to. And then on top of this, we've had uh, what some academics describe to as state-led uh, gentrification policies. And in a pincer movement, we've also had austerity uh, and the impact of austerity on housing, which I'll deal with later. So it's a multi-layered uh, uh, picture. So if you remember the slide I showed you earlier, Elephant Park, uh, Elephant Park actually has been built on the site of this housing estate uh, in Elephant and Castle, which was called the Haygate Estate and was home to 3,000 people, uh, a quarter of whom owned their own homes uh, under right to buy. And it was demolished in uh, 2014. This is one of at least 100 estates across London uh, which have been knocked down and replaced by largely luxury apartments. Uh, according to housing policy, 25% at least of these new developments is designated affordable housing. But in London, the definition of affordable housing was changed in 2010 to mean up to 80% of market rent or market value. So it's very far uh, from affordable. I'm sure you will have versions of this here in Scotland uh, as well, but I suspect they will be less extreme uh, versions. But this idea of regeneration projects where largely for sale property is built in place of social housing and then the sales cross subsidise a level of affordable housing is the model used throughout the UK and it is argued that in a completely cash strapped environment this is the only way to provide any affordable housing. Uh, this is Robin Hood Gardens, a uh, very contested estate uh, which was the subject of a big debate with many architects wanting to have it listed, did not succeed in being listed and this was the same uh, estate last year. I particularly think that's a you know, compelling Im image with the towers of finance capital uh, pressing in. And with places like Robin Hood Gardens and the Haygate, uh, the, the narrative is that these are, are modernist sink estates which blight the lives of residents uh, and uh, they're no longer fit for purpose. And they certainly have that modernist uh, appearance. With an estate like this, this is called Cressingham Gardens, just overlooking Brockwell Park. It got the accolade of being one of the nicest small schemes in England from Reba. It's built in and out of the park. You can't really argue that. Massively loved estate, you know, huge campaign uh, to save it. Uh, this estate, Central Hill, on Gypsy Hill, overlooking the whole of London. Again, another campaign uh, to list it, but also tipped for demolition. So, you know, why at this time of acute housing crisis are councils all across London in the business of demolishing all their housing estates? Well, as I said, the story is, you know, modernist estates been run down, no longer fit for purpose. And it's certainly not just been a conservative policy. Actually, it's been Labour councils who've been at the forefront uh, of a lot of this. The reason, though, a lot of academics put forward and I would concur with is that this is what's called state-led gentrification, driven by the idea of uh, the rent gap. Now, I don't want to talk about Glasgow too much without knowing enough about the context, but I suspect the rent gap is also what drove the demolition of the Red Road flats. I'm sure that there's been a complex, uh, you know, multi-layered picture behind uh, that uh, demolition. But what really struck 
a lot of people outside of this city is that actually the council here proposed demolition, demolishing the towers live as part of the opening ceremony of the Commonwealth Games. And that didn't go ahead uh, because there was a, a resulting outcry. But I think the very fact that it was considered at all shows the way social housing is viewed actually around the country. And that very much kind of feeds into that sink estate narrative, which has been part of, part of the rhetoric for why we're demolishing our housing estates. That's the rhetoric. But as I said, I think the reality comes down to this idea of the rent gap. The rent gap is the gap between the price of land and the potential price of land. And when that gap becomes big enough, uh, capital is attracted uh, into the area. And this was explained quite well by uh, Lord Adonis, uh, Andrew Adonis, the former Labour peer who was appointed by George Osborne to spear this uh, policy uh, when he was chair of the National Infrastructure uh, Commission. And he said, the scale of council owned land is vast and greatly underappreciated. There are particularly large concentrations of council owned land in inner London and this is some of the highest priced land in the world. The local authority planning regime has got to adapt properly to the potential for market priced rent developments. So it's the price of land basically that's uh, the driver here. So to go back to Elephant Park, this is it. This is the resulting development which replaced the Haygate estate prices from 750,000 to a million pounds for a two bedroom apartment, 25% of which are affordable housing, but with affordable housing at 80% of market value, that's not very affordable for many people. Uh, and in the first phase of Elephant Park, 100% of the apartments were sold to foreign investors. So what happened to the tenants well, and the residents? So the tenants, we don't have that many longitudinal studies on this, but actually we're getting more and more now. And the, for anyone who's interested, there's an ERC, ESRC research project on London's estates in place at the moment. Um, this is one of the early studies. Most of the tenants uh, did manage to stay in London. Uh, quite a lot of them in the borough, if not immediately around their networks of schools, uh, uh, communities, surgeries, uh, etc. Um, the really big scandal is what happens to the residents, uh, nearly all of whom have got to have had to leave London, owing to the very, very low values they received uh, in compulsory purchase from the council. And if you think back to the prices I showed you for Elephant Park, the average price of a flat on the Haygate under compulsory purchase was £100,000, which is mind blowing really, uh, and shows you, you know, how little actually those right to buy owners uh, were left with. And when I was writing the book, I felt that was one of the, the biggest scandals. And of course, that's not that's also very much a, a public health issue in terms of the mental health impacts, uh, uh, depression, etc., which comes with having to leave your home uh, as a result of this. Um, this is the CGI of a development called Blackwall Reach. If you remember the slide I showed you of Robin Hood Gardens beforehand. Um, and uh, Blackwall Reach here shown uh, actually was being marketed at the Mandarin Oriental Hotel uh, in Hong Kong before even it had been uh, demolished and it was being marketed uh, at, at uh, these prices. So these places hit foreign investor markets immediately and really that's what's driving their, their that that's what's driving them to in large part they're built what's called off plan so they're built off the plan um, and that builds in a structural instability because although developers will say we've sold 100 percent of the scheme as you can see here actually 
it's 5% on exchange, 5% on after 12 months, and the balance on completion. So that means developers can say, we've sold, five per we've sold 100%, when in fact they've sold 5% of that 100%. And when the market softens, to use the euphemism, actually a lot of those investors will pull out because they'll think, this isn't such a good investment after all. And then the whole thing can come tumbling down. And a lot of these developments that we've been talking about are showing signs uh, of this uh, softening. This is my final slide on uh, Robin Hood Gardens, uh, which is that the V&A uh, recently purchased a three-storey slab uh, of Robin Hood Gardens. Uh, they actually took it by barge to the Venice Biennale, uh, and they're going to put it up in their new V&A East in the Olympic Park with a view to starting a conversation around social housing. And, you know, as you can imagine, this hasn't gone down very well uh, locally. OK, so that's a lot of the material I was covering in the book. Since then, uh, there's been more, m more uh, sort of even greater quickening, uh, which I hadn't really gone into uh, uh, at the time, which is the growing role of private equity uh, through... Uh, firms such as Blackstone, the American company, which is the biggest private equity uh, and the biggest uh, real estate investment company in the world, uh, which specialises particularly in so-called distressed markets, uh, markets which have suffered a uh, property crisis in uh, America, subprime crisis uh, in Ireland, uh, uh, in Spain. They swoop in when rents are low with a view to realising the uplift in prices, again, that rent gap. Uh, and they're increasingly active. In Sweden, they, ha they are the largest uh, uh, owner of private owner of low-income housing. Uh, in Spain, uh, they've similarly bought a huge tranche uh, uh, of housing and they've just moved into the UK as well. Uh, and a new film called Push uh, will be out in January and that traces the role uh, of Blackstone. They're not limited to housing. All sorts of real estate uh, interests them. Uh, they've just bought up this 1.9 billion uh, property portfolio, which is the Arches, Railway Arches property portfolio. I don't know if it includes Scotland. Uh, it's all over England, particularly in London, uh, and is an engine of, I don't want to call it gentrification, of trans... Of, of, of it's fueling the sorts of changes which are transforming areas, pushing out small and medium-sized businesses uh, and changing the nature uh, of local areas. This is the Brixton Arches, uh, which was a particularly controversial um, uh, part of the uh, campaign to save the Arches, which has been ultimately unsuccessful. So I'm going to move on now to talk about the other side of the coin. I've talked about the flood of uh, global capital into the city. I've talked about state-led gentrification policies and why those might be happening. And now it's the other part of the pincer movement, which is um, austerity with regard to housing policies. In the bigger picture of what I'm calling here the death of social housing, uh, which might sound exaggerated, but really over the last 40 years, we've seen a consistent uh, undermining uh, of social housing, which really began with the right to buy and the sell-off of two million council homes. And of course, in Scotland, you're different here because you've abolished right to buy. And that's one of the uh, ways in which your housing policy is so much uh, more progressive than ours and you don't have a conservative government either. You have a government here which I think does believe in social housing, we don't. Um, and um, policy has been underpinned, I don't know to what extent, probably still largely in Scotland as well, by this idea of moving away from bricks to benefits so that rather than building uh, subsidised social homes, uh, actually people are subsidised to live uh, uh, on housing benefit. Uh, 
But what has happened in England, and I don't want to speak about Scotland too much because it probably is different, but what has happened in England is that rents have really, really soared in the private rented sector. 40% of the council housing owned by private landlords is now three to four times more expensive than the council housing literally next door. People will be paying three, four times more for private renting than they will to the local authority. And it's meant that the housing benefit bill has soared to around uh, 10 billion pounds a year. And in order to deal with that, the government capped rents. They, uh, they capped, sorry, they capped, they didn't cap rents. <laughs> That's a Freudian slip. Um, the government capped housing benefit with the view that actually if housing benefit would keep, stay low, then rents would have to stay low, but that didn't happen. So what it's basically meant is that tenants just don't have enough money to pay the rent and they are continually uh, evicted uh, and they are uh, moved out of London to cheaper areas. And it's now official policy for London councils to move homeless families uh, out of London to places, you know, as far afield as Coventry, uh, Middlesbrough and Newcastle for anyone who's seen the film I, Daniel Blake. That is actually exactly what the film is about. The protagonist, one of the protagonists is, uh, fr lives, uh, had lived in London and is moved up to Newcastle where she's there uh, and doesn't, doesn't know anyone at all. And it's, it's a complete sort of nonsensical marketising uh, of housing benefit, which doesn't work for anyone. It doesn't work for this huge housing benefit bill and it doesn't work for anyone who has to live uh, with the system. And I found this quote, uh, I thought this quote explained it uh, very well. Um, so the local housing allowance, which is what housing benefit is now called uh, in Luton for a one bed is 650, but 760 in London. So the landlord can get an extra 110 pounds by de doing a deal with a London borough. But Luton has a housing shortage too. So the stupid bit about it is we're having to do the same and move our people to other cities. So it's completely farcical. Uh, and the people obviously who uh, lose out are people like this uh, single mum who's living in uh, nurses' accommodation, completely unsuitable for uh, families in Welling Garden City, up uh, three, four storeys, no lift. Uh, she's living in this room, uh, well she was, uh, with her two children. It was an awful story. Her baby wasn't well and she had to commute to London to go to Great Ormond Street. And the issue here is that since a change in the law in 2010, uh, families which present themselves uh, as homeless to the council have to accept the first property that they are offered. Otherwise, they're declared intentionally homeless and they won't be offered anything. So they have no choice but to accept uh, this kind of uh, accommodation. And hopefully you do not have these scandalous policies uh, in Scotland, but you might have a version of it. Um, at the same time, we have uh, what's described as generation rent, which I'm sure that you do have, uh, although whether to this extent, I don't know. It's now pretty regular to rent, uh, not rooms, but actually bed spaces. Um, there's absolutely no regulation in the private rented sector uh, and poor conditions, uh, lack of repairs is just a, a standard practice and if tenants complain they can expect uh, an eviction notice. Um, a lot of this is legal, some of it is illegal. Uh, this would be classified as illegal. There is a lot of this kind of illegal uh, overcrowding in London. Uh, and this is at the even more extreme end. These are the so-called beds in sheds, uh, illegal outhouses which don't have planning permission. And there are thousands and thousands of these uh, on the outskirts of London uh, with, you know, unspeakable sorts of conditions. Um, so given all of this, you know, actually the CBI uh, is, is, is concerned that on current trends, staff at every level are being pushed out of London. Uh, uh, key workers, nurses, doctors, teachers, you know, my, my little boy's teacher has to commute an hour and a half 
uh, into work. That's three hours traveling a day. She has to be at school at eight in the morning. I think that's pretty standard actually for teachers living in London, given the wage that uh, a teacher uh, gets. So, you know, you would have thought that people would just leave the city wholesale. But actually what you also see happen is that people start to put up with what had not very long before might have been considered uh, unacceptable conditions. People adjust, you know, this process of, of hedonic adaptation, what you thought you couldn't put up with, you find yourself putting up with. And I think my friend Jan, whose situation I described at the opening of the presentation, is a really good example of that. <clears throat> um, but at the same time, you know, clearly the cracks in the system are also very much at the top end with um, this piece in The Guardian showing that um, the ghost towers are not only because uh, people aren't living there because they're investments. Actually, to nowadays, half of the new build luxury uh, London flats are failing to sell. And again, this may well be the case in other UK cities. So I'm just going to have a few slides talking about how we got here and what we might do about it. Um, we've um, in many ways, I think the biggest problem is part of the solution. We've already talked about land and land prices as being very much behind uh, a lot of this. And actually, the 1947 <coughs> Planning Act, uh, which was part of the post-war settlement, which saw the founding of the NHS uh, and Bevan's uh, Housing Act, the 1947 Planning Act included me mechanisms within it to ensure that the huge rises in land value that automatically come with the granting of planning permission would be used to pay for affordable housing uh, and infrastructure. Um, and actually that did exist in some form or another. What ten it, was, it was difficult to administer. What tended to happen is uh, that Labour stuck to this system. The Tories repealed it, Labour put it back. But it did ex exist until 1986 when uh, Lloyd, uh, Nigel Lawson uh, abolished it. And that's a telling date, 1986, uh, same year uh, as Big Bang. Uh, so very much in, in, in keeping with the times, uh, the deregulation of finance. That's essentially when we deregulated the land market as well. Um, what we're really talking about is a land tax, which is supported by a huge range of historical figures, certainly not just on the left. Um, Adam Smith, Lloyd George uh, and Churchill all supported it. And it's used uh, in very many countries and actually... Um, Governments of both stripes have looked at the issue very carefully. Gordon Brown commissioned a very detailed uh, report uh, by uh, a Bank of England economist, which looked at the topic. Uh, also, uh, conservatives have looked at it very carefully. There's a consensus that this is the right answer, but actually they are in hock to the big house builders. And the big house builders' profits have gone up, went up. This is an outdated figure. It's even more now. Between 2010 and 2015, the, house, the profits of the big house builders went up by 480%. Uh, and that's roughly the same as uh, uh, house price inflation uh, as well. Um, so alongside a land tax, what else can we do? Uh, we need to end the monopoly of the speculative house builders and bring in small players, housing cooperatives, uh, self-build. But above all, we need to build much more social housing. Uh, and we have to be careful about this because there have been lots of talk recently about councils building again. But actually, quite often, that's councils acting as commercial developers. I don't, I don't know what the situation is here in Scotland, so I won't talk about it. Um, we need to clamp down on money laundering and the tax haven status uh, of, well, much of the UK. Uh, and we need to look at policies which look at the city as a contested space, a diverse place uh, for a, a wide variety of people uh, and not a market-led uh, monoculture. The tide is turning. Is the tide turning? I don't know. Well, you know, 
there's not been much change in policy since I wrote the book. In fact, I'd say there's been no change in policy. It felt to me that Grenfell would mark a turning point. It has not marked a turning point. It may have marked a change in public opinion. It hasn't been reflected in government policy. The Labour Party has changed its policy. We've had this pledge uh, from the Labour Party to build uh, very large amounts of new social housing uh, if they were to win uh, the election. Um, and what we've seen is that the housing crisis has risen up uh, the political agenda. Um, but I think we face a very uncertain future. Uh, we don't know if we're going to see an even more right-wing government, which certainly aren't going to prioritise any of these policies uh, at all. Um, at the same time, what um, housing struggles from other parts of the world show us is that the worse it gets, the better it gets, because when the situation is so bad as it, as it was in Spain, their housing crisis reached such a peak, they actually spawned this very success successful housing protest movement, which saw uh, Ada Kalau, uh, uh, who was from that uh, housing background, become the mayor of Barcelona, and she's now starting her second term. So there's an awareness, there's lots of activity, but at the same time, it's, it's a very uncertain picture. But in Scotland, I think the situation is a bit brighter than it is in London. So, thanks. Thank you for listening to this Glasgow Centre for Population Health podcast. If you would like to find out more, search podcasts at gcph.co.uk.